I'm not a doomsayer. If you have been in this church long enough, you know I'm not a really a negative person, nor am I a pessimist. I don't believe that being a Christian and being a pessimist is congruent. But I do believe the United States is in a national crisis. First of all, and uh, for one who um, doesn't handle debt well, I tend to be a little bit anxious when I have a debt over me, whether it's a car or a mortgage or just, you know, credit cards getting a little bit thick. Uh, I worry about it. We owe, the United States owes $31 trillion. Now that, you know, that's a number that just seems a little bit like, you know, ambiguous. A uh, billion, million, trillion, I mean, you know, what's the difference? Well, here is what the difference looks like. <laughs> that's $31 trillion. That's what the government owns, owes people. I'm not sure how we're going to get out of that debt, if it's possible at all. I think we're just too deep. But it's not just about the debt or the economy that I'm worried about. It's the bad politics that prevent us from finding substantive, substantive solutions to the many problems that we are confronted in this great country of ours. And it's not just the political divisiveness that cuts right through our politics, through our institutions, through our churches, and even down through our families. Neither is it the disparity in the rich-poor gap, nor the decline in Christianity. It is all that, but it's more. It's about the increased saber-rattling and muscle-flexing from the other powerful countries in the world today. It's about the climate change that is affecting our country and having disastrous, disastrous effects on the poor nations in the world as well. But it's even more than that. It's more on a personal level, too. We have a mental health crisis manifesting itself in multiple ways, mass shootings, gun violence, the opioid endemic, high suicide rates among youth, depression and anxiety and loneliness off the charts. Americans have also become selfish, self-centered, self-serving, uncaring, rude, and disrespectful. And yet America, Americans, seem oblivious, caught up in their own selfish gains. This is not unlike Isaiah's time. Today I want to begin a four-part series on the book of Isaiah, Obviously, we cannot cover the whole book in four sermons, but we can have a bit of an overview as to what was happening during the time in Isaiah. Hopefully, pick up a few pointers in how to address issues that we face today with the help and guidance always, of course, from God. It's been pretty well established that the book of Isaiah is a composite book made up of three Isaiahs from three different periods of time. The first Isaiah is the chapters 1 through 39. He lived between the ages, the years of 738 till around 700 BC. The second Isaiah, chapters 40 to 55, lived through the Babylonian exile between the years of 597 and 539 BC. And then the third Isaiah in chapters 55, 66, lived in the period between 530 and 515 BC. Now, you'd find some people would argue about that. One's Isaiah, the book says it's one Isaiah, it's one Isaiah. But probably the majority of today's scholars can claim that Isaiah, based on the years, the prophecies that they're, they're prophesying, uh, the, the style in their writing, the, the, the language they use, the words, and so on, at least two different prophets from two distinct time periods. 
But today we want to focus on the first, Isaiah, and he lived in tumultuous times in the northern kingdom. If you remember, after following, after um, King Solomon's reign, the nation split in two. The northern kingdom was Israel, the southern kingdom was Judah. Isaiah's own ministry then began in that year, the king Uzziah died, and that would have been around 738 BC. The nation had strayed from a community that centered on God's love and love for each other to a nation not unlike ours, where individual prosperity trumped national well-being, where people became self-centered and the tribes of Israel divided. And with King Isaiah's death, things were beginning to happen that the nation was ill-prepared for. The international situation, again, not unlike ours, was extremely tense. Egypt, to the west and south, was rising. <clears throat> Syria was a growing threat in the north. And Assyria was a menacing global power. However, the people of Israel were oblivious seemed blind to these growing threats. So in the first part of our scripture reading today, Isaiah has this doozy of a vision. I'd call it a nightmare. <clears throat> <coughs> the atmosphere is dark and sinister, and yet God is there on God's throne with the hem of his garment filling the temple. Seraphs were in attendance, smoke filled the gloom, smoke filled the room, and Isaiah was filled with gloom. It feels like the day of judgment. There was Isaiah standing before God like an accused before a court of law. But instead of hearing a sentence of punishment, Isaiah is forgiven. And now God speaks for the first time. Whom shall I send? Who will go? And as courageous as little Frodo in Tolkien's trilogy, Isaiah responds meekly, Here I am. Send me. God had called that nation to repentance time after time, over and over again. Got something in my craw. <clears throat> Don't want to come out either. God called them to repentance over and over again until God's blue in the face, if that is possible. Now God, in this passage here, is through trying to get through to these people. God is past warning them. God tells Isaiah, preach to the people. <laughs> Let them hear but not comprehend. Let them see but not understand. Make their minds dull. Plug their ears. Shut their eyes. Poor little meek Isaiah. For how long, Lord? For how long? Until the cities lie waste and desolate. Until they're without inhabitants. Houses without people, land completely desolate, until all are driven away and emptiness is everywhere. If only a tenth of the people are left, even they will be destroyed. But just as stumps remain after trees have been cut down, some of my chosen ones will be left. God's message in this passage is of gloom and doom. There's nothing hopeful about it, except for one thing, the stump. Hang on to the stump. We're not going there today, but hang on to the stump. The imagery is one of exile, people driven away from their homes until all is desolate. And who's to blame? Is God? It's, it's the people, Alice. Thank you. 
They turned a blind eye to the problems and issues at hand running rampant in their country. They exchanged the truth for a pack of lies. Similarities? Or am I just way off base? Alice, you got an opinion? <laughs> Even though they were hearing Isaiah, they were not engaged in the conversation. They did not hear what was being said. It's kind of like the expression going in one year, ear and uh-huh, you got it. There is a difference then between hearing and listening. Hearing is passive. Right? I hear Interstate 64 all the time. It's just noise. I don't pay any attention to it. I hear the train down here as it's going west towards Roanoke. On, when, the, when the southern wind blows, I can hear it. But I don't pay any attention to it. It's involuntary. It happens. We hear it. It requires no effort to hear. Physiological perception of sound. We recognize that there is sound in the background. You want to um, privy me on what's, uh, what's cute? <laughs> I'm just kidding. Oh. <laughs> yes, we all do need some earwax cleaning. Versus listening. Listening is active. It is voluntary. You choose to listen. It re does require effort, doesn't it? You sit down with a person and you're having a conversation. You listen with intent. And it's an intentional interpretation of the sound. You listen to it and you seek to understand what it is that you're hearing. Often people hear rather than listen because they are thinking through what they themselves are going to say when the other person finally shuts up. We do that all the time. I confess, I do it too sometimes. That's hearing, not listening. The website explains why. You may not have learned the skill of listening. This is perhaps the most common reason. You may be busy, distracted, or daydreaming. You may have social anxiety, which can make it harder to listen because you are focused on planning what to say next or worried about what others are thinking about you. I would add one more. We hear instead of listen because we are saturated with the opinion of others. It has gotten to the point where it's just background noise, whether it's through seeing on social media, hearing on the news. We have become so tired of everyone's opinion. We hear it in the news by our politicians, by our social media, and even chagrin, chagrin, by our ministers, who's rattling on and on. It becomes so loud and annoying that we tune it out. And when we do, we tune out the good with the bad because God is also speaking. But we turn a deaf ear to God's truths. And the truth of it is, is that the truth that changes our personal lives, that can change our corporate lives as a nation, is the truth that most don't want to hear. So what do we do? We're caught between a rock and a hard place. We're in difficult times. We are in a national crisis. Well, like Isaiah in the first part of our scripture reading, we need to recognize our own complicity in all of it. We can't just say, hey, you guys. It's, hey, us guys. We're in it together, right? We, too, stand before the God of the universe. We, too, have unclean lips. With unclean lips, we speak gossip. With unclean lips, we speak down to people. With, uh, <coughs> <coughs> With unclean lips, we spew hatred and lies. 
with unclean lips, we argue like we have the corner on truth. We hear but do not listen. We look but do not understand. We have unclean lips and we live with unclean lip people. And so we as individuals and as a nation, we need to do something about it. And it begins with individuals and it begins with congregations and it begins with communities and it begins with our vote and it begins with all sorts of things that we can do to be involved. We need to humble ourselves, first of all, before the Lord. We need to pray and we need to seek God's grace and mercy and guidance. I was rummaging through my little shoebox full of sermons that my grandfather wrote many years ago. He preached a sermon in 1962 on this subject at the Terrace View Church of the Brethren in Bedford County, Virginia. And so I was waded through there. I was having some problems trying to finish the sermon. So I thought, well, maybe Grandpa has something to say about this. Even though 62, nah, it probably wouldn't be relevant. I looked through it anyway. This is his concluding thoughts. 1962, I think we are living in times of spiritual drought. The world is in a state of tension and men's hearts are failing them for fear. But don't forget God has promised blessings when men turn to him in penitence and faith. Do we wish to do something to make this a better world in which we live? Do we wish to see that righteousness was, which exalted a nation is established in the land? Do we wish to see the windows of heaven opened and blessings poured out? Then this is what we need to do. Second Chronicles 7.14 If my people, let's say it together, if my people who are called by my name humble themselves, pray, seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. God bless the reading of his message. And so whether the year is 738 B.C., or whether it's 1962, or whether it's 2023, the formula is still the same. Seek the Lord and his righteousness, and all good things will be added unto you. I want to end with a prayer by Sir Francis Drake. Pray with me. Pray with me. <clears throat> Disturb us, Lord, when we are too well pleased with ourselves, when our dreams have come true because we have dreamed too little, when we arrive safely because we have sailed too close to the shore. Disturb us, Lord, when with the abundance of things we possess, we have lost our thirst for the waters of life. Having fallen in love with life, we have ceased to dream of eternity. And in our efforts to build a new earth, we have allowed our vision of the new heaven to dim. Disturb us, Lord, to dare more boldly, to venture on wider seas where storms will show your mastery, where losing sight of land, we shall find the stars. We ask you to push back the horizons of our hopes and to push into the future in strength, courage, hope, and love. Gracious God, redeeming God, guiding and comforting God. Help us begin by asking what Isaiah asked, answering what Isaiah was asked by God. Whom shall I send and who will go? Lord, give us the courage to say, here I am, send me. In the name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior, we pray. Amen.